course, we've kept our housing open for our residents in Chicago and in Atlanta. And this week, we actually have been receiving some folks who have been re released from Cook County uh, Detention Center uh, into our housing. So we just ask that y'all keep them in your prayers and for the safety of our communities. Um, and then, of course, we've been doing a lot of virtual programming. And this Internet Cypher is really born out of, um, you know, out of this need from our community to stay connected to be inspired we're so grateful for, to the artists there are actually there are some memes going about we were just talking about like frontline workers there's some uh you know little images going around about how artists are the frontline workers they're the ones who are providing inspiration i mean it's like netflix that's getting people through this 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 quarantine it's it's uh ig lives so we're super grateful to the artists for you know, all the, 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 the talent that you've been crafting and for giving us what uh, you all do. And um, Omar, we're grateful to you for what you're about to share in this, um, in this cipher. So, so basically Omar is gonna take us through his personal, you know, journey and talk to us about his project. So I'm not gonna do too much of an introduction, but um, you know, this is a uh, like acclaimed rapper, poet, activist um and is honestly just such a, a beautiful soul and i'm not saying that to be corny like i'm for real thank you um omar for everything that you bring um but i just i'll just turn it over to you to talk a little bit about your story and if you want to talk about the pronunciation of your name that i know you prefer but i'm sorry i'd, I'd go the other way oh good <clears throat> salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh peace and blessings to each and every one of you thank you for taking time out of your busy afternoon evening depending on where you are to join us here uh, i'm really really excited about this opportunity to engage with folks in a more intimate way um, the event that we had last night uh, i didn't get to see faces like this so this is really helpful for me um, what i was hoping that we could do first of all was just acknowledge um, as we had done in the roster call earlier, the original caretakers of this land who make it possible for us to even be here. Uh, we understand that there were um, ways of weaponizing illness that made it possible uh, for folks to take over this country the way that they had. Uh, and that is a lasting legacy that has touched every single part of Turtle Island. And so um, we're all now in a position where we have to sit and reflect on something like that in a deeper way, I think is, um, is important, is necessary. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the struggles and the sacrifices of our African American brothers and sisters who paved the way for people like me to do what I do with rap and hip hop. Uh, and so the lyrical legacy of people like Langston Hughes, the lyrical legacy of people like The Last Poets and Gil Scott Heron and all of them uh, are, 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 are just as instrumental to any of the rappers who I grew up listening to uh, and any of the musicians who I grew up idolizing. Uh, I also wanted to say I grew up in a kind of unique way here uh, in America. You know, my family is an immigrant family from Syria. Uh, so we had moved here when I was about four years old. I was the youngest of four. Uh, and when we had settled in the Washington, D.C. area, it was kind of serendipitous that that very same year, a school was founded there, uh, the first Muslim school in the area uh, that offered an immersive Arabic language uh, curriculum in addition to the local uh, Fairfax County curriculum that was being offered there. Uh, and this was intentionally done for the children of people whose parents worked at embassies to be able to kind of go back uh, after two or three years uh, and just transition back into the Middle East a little bit easier. Um, Middle East and North Africa, depending on where they were coming from, uh, if they were from an Arabic speaking country. But the truth is, it was also just open to anybody who wanted to send their kid there. And most importantly, it was actually fully funded by the Saudi government. Uh, so it was free, which is a very, very uh, strange thing to think about these days. But this was the 80s and oil money was flowing and things are different, I guess. But um, that said, I, I felt very privileged in retrospect when I thought about this sort of schooling that I had because I was surrounded by Muslims from all over the world. Uh, and this is something that I think has really shaped who I am. My understanding of the faith practice, my understanding of the Arabic language has so much to do with the way that uh, it was taught to me in the school. Uh, and so every single day, uh, for folks who are familiar with the Arabic language or not, um, you know, it's important to note that poetry is really the backbone of the language. And so we were taught Arabic poetry from a very young age. And the process of memorization that comes with, you know, Muslim schooling when it comes to Quran was also um, something that was used when, you know, it came to teaching the language through the poetry. 
so that was something that was embedded in me from a very young age at school, but it was also complemented by my mother at home. Um, my mother uh, studied Arabic literature at the University of Damascus, and it was really, really important to her to be able to, to raise us in a home that appreciated the Arabic language, knowing that we wouldn't have access to it necessarily had we not been um, you know, sort of uh, supplemented at home because I had friends who went to the school who didn't necessarily have that. And so it wasn't, you know, quite as important. And so I, I thank my mother for that uh, before I, I say anything else. Um, and I also grew up, you know, in the DC area. It was affectionately dubbed Chocolate City, though the demographics have shifted recently. Um, but black culture and hip hop culture was there from, uh, you know, as far as I can remember, uh, watching Rap City in the basement with Tigger and just listening to WPGC, WK, WKYS, these like local hip hop mainstay radio stations. So that sort of stuff was like playing in my, in my headphones as I was going to school. And then when I'd get to school, I'd start being immersed in this like, middle-aged, uh, or not middle-aged, but poetry from the Middle Ages uh, in the Arab world. It created a really interesting juxtaposition in, in, in my brain. Uh, <laughs> and the sonic backdrop of my youth sort of started to, to meld together with this poetry. Uh, and when I tried to explain to my teachers in school how I felt that there was like a you know, really deep and beautiful connection between what hip hop artists were doing and the ways that they were expressing themselves here through rap music, uh, that there was a deep connection to that in the way that the poets of uh, the Arabic speaking world were also expressing themselves throughout these centuries. Uh, I would sort of get scoffed at, you know, my teachers didn't necessarily want to appreciate uh, something like that. So in many ways, it kind of has just been like um, a mission to prove them wrong. <laughs> um, but before I go any further, I just want to say I'd really love for this to be more of a conversation than a presentation. So when I'm done with this sort of intro about me, um, I would love for anybody who felt like they wanted to share anything or raise their hand to kind of uh, interject with something, uh, by all means, feel free to do so. We don't have to leave it to the Q&A section at the end to get into that. So the poetry. So, yes. Is this a moment to ask a question? Go ahead. Yes. OK. So. Um... First of all, I love all of that, and I'm so eager to hear what others think about all the connections you made with the different cultures. But I have a question about when you said Arabic is the, the backbone of the, I mean, poetry is the backbone of Arabic. Like, I don't, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So what I mean by that is, you know, this is an oral culture and tradition that had not been written down for centuries and centuries. You know, the Arab Bedouins of uh, the peninsula. Uh, were not in the habit of writing. You know, this was the way that they kept their culture and their tradition and their history alive. Uh, and so it was a very, very important role that the poet played in uh, Arab society, in many ways representing the tribes publicly. They were like emissaries, they were uh, beef settlers, they were, you know, all, all kind of important um, griot, you know, uh, keepers of the tradition and the history and the story uh, of, of the people. And that very much had a huge influence on Islam. Uh, I think it's undeniable just to see the way that the word is so central to what we do, memorization and recitation uh, and the rhythmic nature of it uh, are all kind of part and parcel of the fact that, 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 that this is the backbone of the culture, uh, of the language. You know, they, borrow, they ultimately ended up borrowing letters from uh, Syriac and Aramaic to be able to write the Arabic language and then it slowly evolved into what we have today. Uh, you, you might be familiar with some of the earlier copies of the Quran that are like, you know, the letters are disconnected and there's no dots and no um, tashkil. And so, you know, that was more so the way that the Syriac language was being written and then it, and then it slowly started to evolve. Um, but that's, you know, part and parcel of the trajectory of, of the faith, you know, kind of being um, in and around Mecca and Medina and then slowly spreading into Bilad al-Sham, where my people are from, which is greater Syria, and then sort of crossing over into different regions around the world very quickly, as we know. Um, but it's very important to understand why, you know, like that, that, that was so crucial to even the rise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his ability to command an audience and command people's attention uh, was because this respect for the word was already so, so present. Uh, and so for, for him to have, uh, you know, the effect that he had, it was absolutely imperative that he was able to, for lack of a better word, rock the mic, you know, and uh, <laughs> it, um, 
it's something that I think about now as well in terms of the way that hip hop culture has just spread so quickly all over the globe. It's a universal culture in many ways. There are so many beautiful parallels between the two. Uh, and as we all know, you know, uh, Islam is central to hip hop and to hip hop culture uh, and has been from the outset. And so whether it's through the five percenter or the nation of Islam or traditional sort of Muslim um, kind of frameworks, uh, the idea that someone would, would be saying Allah or Muhammad or, you know, break fast like Ramadan on a track was, uh, was dope to me, you know, like it made me feel like I could connect in a deeper way than a lot of the other things that I was hearing um, on the radio or watching, you know, on MTV. And uh, it was validating, you know, so I think it was like actually the two, the, the, the representation in that way, uh, the, the sort of like uh, understanding how, you know, the Arabic language is being peppered throughout hip hop and how, um, uh, how some artists, whether they were vocal about it or not, were Muslim, um, you know, uh, was something that drew me to it. And then also the presence of an artist like Big Pun, who rapped in Spanish and in English and was the first, you know, Latin rapper to go platinum and represent his culture. And the fact that hip hop was open to that, you know, um, and the fact that, it, you know, that, that the presence of someone doing that and, and, and sampling from his heritage and, you know, being Puerto Rican and being proud of it. I mean, it's indicative of New York. It's indicative of, of the Bronx for sure, but it's also just indicative of, of the culture as well, um, which was rooted in the Bronx. But that said, you know, uh, I, I remember when we were in Arabic class, how um, they would break down, um, you know, the different sort of sections or, 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 or oceans of Arabic poetry that exist. Uh, and they were just thematic sort of classifications, if you will. So there would be uh, like Sha'r al-Ghazal. Ghazal is like flirtatious love poetry of which there are, you know, so many examples. Um, some of the most, one of the most famous ones is uh, Majnoon Layla. If you uh, ever uh, take a listen to my first album, you hear my sort of rendition of it in English. But uh, the story of Layla and Majnoon is, or Qais and Layla rather, uh, is like a story of star-crossed love. And there is countless verse of how infatuated this young man was with this woman. Uh, and that slowly evolved into a beautiful metaphor for our relationship with the creator and was taken upon uh, wholeheartedly by Sufi traditions and used uh, to sort of really expound upon the idea of our, our, our everlasting and infinite love that we have for, for the one. So there's Sha'ar al-Ghazal, uh, there's Sha'ar al-Ritha. Ritha is essentially eulogy uh, and a poetic eulogy was so, so important, you know, to, to understand uh, whether it was, um, you know, someone just in someone's family, uh, like we have this beautiful example of uh, Al-Khansa, who was uh, a North African poet, uh, who, you know, she had written one of the most profound poetic eulogies uh, about her brother when he had passed away. Uh, and this is in the Islamic tradition and the Arabic tradition, and it's recognized as one of the most beautiful and most profound ones. Um, and so the presence of men and women, you know, within the poetic realm uh, was always there and always necessary. Um, there's also, you know, the, 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 the countless verses of the, of, you know, praise of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and, and eulogy, uh, but there's also praise poetry. So Sha'ar al-Madah, when you're praising, uh, whether it is the Prophet Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or just, uh, you know, a leader who, who you had maybe um, got some benefit from praising, you know, uh, and the idea that poets could actually be used as a tool by those in power, um, you know, to kind of, um, A, get respect from, uh, you know, people, but B, also like kind of push certain agendas uh, is nothing new. And it's something that we see even in hip hop culture today. I'm kind of like dumbfounded by how willingly rappers and voluntarily rappers promote brands that they don't even have any actual financial connection to or benefit from. Uh, but it's something that exists, you know, uh, and it has always been. Um, there's a really fascinating example of um, poetic praise. Uh, Al Mutanabbi, I believe, was um, he had like a line where he said, Anta kal kalb fil wafa. So, like, he was praising this leader and he's saying, You are like a dog. And the guy was like, What? And all his guards were like, What? And they all leaned in and he's like, in how loyal you are, you know? And then everybody like chilled out a little bit. And so you have all these really interesting sort of like anecdotal moments. Um, 
شعر الغزل شعر المدح شعر I should say is poetry you know um, and so it's also the same sort of root word as just feeling and so it's like literally putting words to feelings you know um, and emotions and so it's like so deeply connected to our spiritual and soul you know uh, our spiritual well-being and our soul to be able to kind of connect to uh, to poetry in this way Shar al Rita, Shar al Ghazal, Shar al Madah, and of course, I mean Shar al Hija. Hija is battle poetry. So literally, poets battling one another in the middle of the Arabian desert, talking shit about each other's mamas and being crazy and wild, uh, is something that has always existed as well. Uh, a lot of ego and posturing and all that stuff that I'm not necessarily drawn to within the realm of hip hop, but I. I can respect and appreciate when it's done well. Um, and the same goes for, for, for this poetry too. Um, so yeah, you know, the way that they'd be breaking them down like that would just immediately remind me of some of the things I was hearing rappers do, whether it was, you know, pouring one out for the homies and saying, I miss my uncle Charles, y'all, you know, like uh, talking about Shara uh, Rithat, in my opinion, you know, that's eulogy right there. Or, um, praise praising as i said whether it's brands or just praising oneself and talking about how much of a, a badass poet uh he he or she is uh one of my favorite examples is uh, again al mutanabbi who um for those who aren't familiar he is like the probably the most prolific poet of uh arabic or arab history um lived in you know the abbasid era the abbasid caliphate uh and that was centered in baghdad and um his name even, Abu Tayyib al-Mutanabbi. Al-Mutanabbi means he who like uh, claimed prophethood, you know? And it's, it's said that he thought he was so dope that he was, you know, a prophet. He had like a line that sort of alluded to that. Um, so, you know, they often even told the line in that way. Um, but he had one of his most famous lines that people are very familiar with all over the Arab world is, um, الخيل والليل والبيداء تعرفني والسيف والرمح والقرطاس والقلم. So he's saying the horse uh, and the night and the wilderness, they know me. Uh, and the sword and the spear and the tablet and the pen. So he's like swearing by all these things that know him. He's basically saying, ask about me. Like anywhere you go, people know me. I am the R to the A to the K I am. And if I wasn't, then why would I say I am? So... The, the, you know, the idea that someone reflects in that way uh, is not anything new either, um, but it's just so beautiful for me to kind of witness within hip hop culture and to be able then to, you know, dig it a little deeper and just say, hey, this is like, this is the way that human beings have expressed themselves, you know, historically throughout time in all these different ways. And, you know, to keep on breaking things up and classifying them and separating them as these different things isn't always helpful. Um, and in fact, in my experience growing up in this country, it was necessary for my own well-being to be able to make those connections and, uh, and reconciliations even. Um, even if my Arabic teachers weren't trying to hear it. I was doing it in my head. And now I go to schools and I teach kids about it. So that's <laughs> I have another question. I think you just kind of spilled into it. But my question was, do you, um, so, so like you were the one making these connections for yourself in your head. And like, what, what was that like? And I mean, just that's, that's incredible. So I just want to hear more about like that process. And how old were you? Like, what, what was that like? Uh, I mean, you know, like a uh, preteen, teenager listening to hip hop music um, and uh, and like, so I should also say um, this was, you know, a private Muslim school. So uh, we had the privilege of being picked up by a bus that dropped us off from our front doorstep to the school. But that privilege was counterbalanced by the fact that it was far away. So I was on this bus for two hours a day. So the bus is where I would listen to music because once I entered the school, music was haram and we weren't taught music in school. So it was actually a very sort of conservative bent that um, the Saudi administration had uh, when it came to music. Caveat was they had a bunch of little kids singing songs for the prince whenever he rolled up, but we don't need to get into that. Um, so the idea that I, you know, would be listening to this stuff on the way to school or after school um, on the bus for hours, literally, uh, and then show up there and have to just like switch years 
it wasn't possible, you know? So like, it would still be floating around in my head and I'd be sitting in a class and hear him say something like, hear a teacher, her or him say something like that. Uh, you know, like referencing an old line of poetry. And I'd be like, huh, that reminds me of so-and-so. And then sometimes I'd be brave enough to raise my hand and be like, yo, that reminds me of so-and-so. And I'd be like, shut up. And then so, you know, enough times hearing shut up or that's ridiculous or stop listening to that stuff. I think it just kind of pushed me to where, <laughs> where I am now. Um, but respectfully so. Uh, another thing that was really interesting was that even within the realm of Arabic poetry, because of the kind of uh, school that I was in, or at least the way certain people felt about poetry or about music, um, uh, a poet like Nizar Qabani, who a lot of people who are familiar with my work know that I recite and cite him often, um, he, uh, he was the foremost poet of the 20th century in the Arab world from Syria, from Damascus. Uh, but some of his stuff was a little bit racy for uh, certain um, uh, sensibilities, even though I think like it's like maybe a PG rating. But, you know, uh, this is the Arab world. So we're talking about people who, you know, um, aren't as comfortable talking about um, sexuality or talking about uh, just relationships in general. Uh, so his work was banned uh, in Saudi for a while. It was also politically things that he had said, politically motivated pieces that wouldn't get taught to us, you know. Um, Mahmoud Darwish, same thing, a Palestinian poet from the 20th century who, um, you know, was very, very, very pro-Palestine. Uh, and uh, depending on how far he went with it, we wouldn't get exposed to his work either. But Thankfully, I had my mother at home to expose me to it. Uh, in fact, um, I don't know if anybody uh, caught the, uh, the Tell Them I Am podcast last Ramadan. Had folks, uh, was anybody familiar with it? Yeah, thumbs up, yes, no. Uh, so Tell Them I Am was a really, really dope podcast that came out uh, last Ramadan by a local um, podcaster, is that the word? Uh, Misha Youssef, a really, really amazing uh, young woman here in Southern California, interviewed a bunch of Muslim um, figures, uh, political celebrity artists, folks. Um, but it wasn't about being Muslim. It wasn't about all the typical stuff that NPR would ask you about. It was simply about like a moment in our lives that was sort of defining. Um, and so I, I talked about how um, uh, when I was about 14, I think, um, my mother had like volunteered me uh, to go <laughs> uh, to go and recite poetry um, in honor of Nizar Qabani at his memorial service that was being held at Georgetown University. Um, and so, you know, I, it was really the first time I ever got on stage and did anything like that. Um, I was very familiar with memorizing poetry at that point. So that wasn't the issue. It was more so just the idea of getting up in front of a bunch of people that I'd never seen before and sharing in that way. Uh, and so I walk into this room at Georgetown and it's professors and politicians. He was an ambassador. So there's like, you know, um, people from embassies there. And it was, uh, it was intimidating. And I had my little suit on. I was trying to be all like, you know, sharp, whatever. Um, and, and so that's my little baby girl knocking on the window, sorry. Um, so, uh, so I get up on stage and I do my thing and I don't fumble through it too much and it was decent, you know. Um, but what was interesting was that uh, after I got up, uh, again, this is after professors had recited his poetry and expounded upon how fascinating and, and you know, important his work was. Um, uh, after I got up, his brother got up uh, and spoke, and uh, Rashid Qabbani uh, was kind of like a grandfather figure to me. I had the privilege of knowing him. He grew up in, or he didn't grow up in, but he lived in the D.C. area at the time, uh, and so our families were friends, and, you know, after I did what I did, he got up and spoke about his brother, and he said, look at the effect that my brother's work has had on, you know, multiple generations of people, uh, and he referenced, you know, like this older ambassador who had gotten up and spoken. And then he referenced uh, some of the famous singers who had sung his work before, Abdul Halim Hafiz and Qadim Asahar. And then he said, well, had al-Fasun is leading this little rug rat over here, Omar, too. Like, you know, it's intergenerational. 
Uh, and it was like a, it was a cute moment of recognition and meant a lot to me, you know, the fact that he even said that um, was, was powerful for me uh, in hindsight. I think what it also showed me and taught me in that moment was that when art and poetry comes from an honest place, it has the ability to resonate across time and space in ways that that person who created it might have never even understood or imagined. Um, and so, you know, just before that had happened, just before he had passed away, um, I, uh, I, I was gifted a book of poetry that he had signed uh, quite literally on his deathbed. His brother, Amr Rashid, had gotten it for me. And it was his last book of poetry that he had published. And in it, he said, you know, uh, this is for Omar. May you continue in your poetic pursuits throughout life. It was written in Arabic. Um, and so it's like my most prized possession uh, in some ways. Uh, and... I don't think he could have ever, you know, predicted how much of an impact just that little gesture had on on me and my life. Uh, so, yeah, rest in peace, Nizar Qabani. And without further ado, I wanted to just take this moment to recite and perform something for you all that you've seen me probably do many times before. This is, in fact, uh, the translation of the poem that I recited that day when I was 14 years old in front of a bunch of people I'd never met at Georgetown. Uh, and it was one of the very first tracks I recorded, um, you know, once I started getting into the habit of recording music. It's called Damascus. It's about the uh, beautiful city of Damascus that my mother is from. Uh, originally titled Al Qasida al Dimashqiya, the Damascene poem. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll notice that in this poem, it's really a poem of praise. Uh, he's praising and describing this, this, this beautiful city, uh, one of the longest continuously inhabited cities on earth. It's also, um, you know, it, it gets into, and I'll talk about it after I perform it, but it gets into some really interesting sort of political critique and then also critique of other poets who are using their work in ways that he wasn't very fond of, uh, kind of like I was talking about where, uh, you know, where you have this sense of responsibility uh, with art and, um, you know, some people use it uh, and some people abuse it. So, yeah. Um, Damascus is the one, actually, sister, if you could pull that one up. Thank you. Uh, my daughter keeps banging on the window trying to come out here, y'all. I might show you her little face before this is done. <laughs> before I go, any questions before we get into it? From Sadia 1 or Sadia 2 or anybody else? <laughs> um, there aren't any questions in the chat yet, but if y'all have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Cool. Um, so yeah. I actually had a question. Um, so you mentioned Madaih, like uh, poets of pr uh, poetry of praise, mm. um, and uh, I, it got me thinking about like the like Burda and like these sort of like uh, mainstream, if you would call it, um, versions of Madaih, and I'm thinking about uh, how I guess traditionally or religiously, or I'm not sure what the term is, it's like they usually use just a drum, you know? There are no like string instruments or other instruments for that matter, horn, flute, uh, woodwinds. Um, so I was kind of thinking like, um, where, I guess, where are you or where is the mainstream Islam in like sort of bridging that like Arabi tradition of like Arabic poetry uh, and Madaih? with like hip hop, you know? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of people doing beautiful work in that realm. Um, and it's something that I've, I've thought about, but I haven't quite done, you know, in mm -hmm. earnest. Um, I think it's uh, obviously very important, but in, some ways I feel like I just kind of, when the time is right for something, I kind of I do it and I focus on it. Mm. And I feel like inshallah at some point in my life that might present itself to me in a way that I feel um, I could contribute. Um, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm kind of yeah. having an answer. But like- yeah, I, just, I mean, it was more of just like a comment kind of. Yeah, no. yeah. I mean, I also like I um, I respect and appreciate, you know, um, Nasheed artists, but uh, 
it's not really what I am. And I also find, um, huh, like, in some ways, the medium is the message. So like the fact that I can get up and connect with people, at least here in America, in, in a certain way through hip hop, uh, in the way that I do, uh, can turn them on to, to a certain journey of discovery about our beloved prophet and about our faith practice in a way that isn't necessarily so, you know, overt or on the nose about it. Um, uh, yeah, that's just kind of that, I guess. Um, but you got me thinking, brother. I appreciate the question. Also, uh, is your sister still out here in Cali? She is. She is. Yeah. She is. yeah. She's you north of me? California. I will. Me. I will. Let me talk to her. She's in Oxnard, right? Or? Yep. Oxnard. Cool. Cool. Um, so yeah, without further ado, you know, the city of Damascus was also deeply, deeply um, important to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to many prophets before him. Uh, it is a, a very, very fascinating place to visit uh, just from, you know, an architectural perspective, from a historical perspective, but certainly from, you know, uh, the, perspect the perspective of a Muslim or Christian or Jew. Um, there is so much there, literally, like, within the foundations of the old city. Uh, if you go to the great mosque of Damascus, for example, which used to be a church, which used to be a Roman temple to Jupiter, which used to be a temple to the storm god Baal, and who knows how far back it goes, that particular plot of land. Uh, but if you look at the foundation of the masjid, you can literally see the layers of stone that were built upon from those different eras. Uh, I studied architecture at the University of Virginia. I think I left that out. Uh, and architecture was a big part of my life. I had the privilege of um, interning at the Historic Renovation Committee in the old city of Damascus for uh, a few summers in college. Uh, and so I got to be very intimately um, connected to the city beyond just the fact that my family you know, is from there and has roots there. Uh, my mother also moved back uh, in 2000 and my sister as well. And so, um, you know, that, that connection got even deeper. Um, but it was really the poetry of Nizar Qabani and this perhaps is poem in particular that really sort of like uh, was the time capsule or the rhyme capsule that like, uh, that first instilled that love in me. Uh, and you can see here in the beginning, um, thank you for pulling it up sister uh, you see the very first opening lines of it hadi dimashq wa hadi al ka's wa al rah inni uhibbu wa ba'd al hubb dhabah so this is the mascus and this is a glass of spirit so you know nizar qabani was kind of open about uh, his uh, his drinky drink every now and again uh, <laughs> I love, but I'm aware of the fact that certain kinds of love can slaughter you, can kill you. So he's being very open about the fact that also, if you know, if you're not careful, um, you know, something like alcohol can have a, a, a you know, a, a fatal effect on you. Uh, and he was likening that to his love for the city of Damascus. Um, and you know, I think this poem was written when he was in London. Uh, and he had a sort of, uh, at times, kind of fraught relationship with those in power in Syria, wasn't allowed back for a while, and then ultimately he, he, he was able to squash it uh, and go back and be buried there. Um, but, uh, but I imagine that he had written this, this, this poem uh, sort of, you know, away from his, his beloved city and thinking about it and longing for it. Um, and so, yeah. This was, uh, this was how I interpreted it. And I think when I had first uh, did this piece, when I first recorded it and started performing it, one of the things that I felt was uh, the best compliment I could be given was the, was the fact that most people didn't even realize that it was an Arabic poem that I had translated in the beginning, uh, because I felt like I had done it justice as far as like a hip hop uh, track, um, so. Can y'all hear? So, if I ask you what's Damascus like, tell me that it's like a glimpse into the afterlife, all right? So if they ask you what's Damascus like, say it's a glimpse into the afterlife. That's what I tell them when they uh, ask me what's Damascus like. I tell them that it's like a glimpse into the afterlife, a hellish heaven, heavenly hell, when relishing in poetic embellishments, memory fails. See, this is Damascus. And this is a glass of spirit comfort I love, but I'm aware of the fact that certain kinds of love can slaughter you in that wrath. 
I'm a Damascene being, dissect me into haves and have not. But grapes and apples fall in your path. Open my veins with scalpels, hear ancestral chants and part. Transplants can cure some of the passion. Why does mine stay torn in half? And minarets crying tears of absence, like trees are so speak. Years are past them. You can hear them asking for civil rights to live amongst tears of jasmine as house cats take naps, relaxing. This is Damascus. And this is a uh, Mexican crooner, Armando Mancinero, saying, as you can read here, this is how I feel for you. So, if I ask you what's the mask it's like, just tell me that it's like a glimpse into the afterlife, all right? So if they ask you what's the mask it's like, say it's a glimpse into the... That's what I tell them when they, hey, ask me what's the mask it's like. I tell them that it's like a glimpse into the afterlife, a hellish heaven, heavenly hell, with relishing and poetic embellishments, memory fails, coffee grinders crackling, childhood reminders back when how could I forget when my reaction to cardamom strong fragrance yet and still finds attraction. As proud fathers wait for a sweet daughter's face, I'm asking, my roots, heart, and language are here. How am I supposed to make myself any more clear? Is clarification necessary with love so dear? So much so, there was no fear. How many Damascene bracelets were sold for this poetry here? Apologizing to the willow, wondering if my little siblings can hear. My parts been scattered cross coast for years. Lanterns on horizons floating, saddened eyes had lost their hopes. To see it. Es la cosa más triste de este mundo. Y así me siento yo por ti, solo por ti. So, Hadi Dimashu, Wahadil Katsu, Wara, in the Ohib, Wabadul Hubbi, the Bah, Hadi Dimashu, Wahadil Katsu, Wara, in the Ohib, Wabadul Hubbi. We toss around in shoreless oceans only to be hunted down by devils and demonic ghosts. I battle garbage, rapid pros and rapid flows. It's apropos until no war is open to them. That's for show sure. identity, yeah. Arabness resembling a widow, though. Was there no festivus for the rest of this? History books can show what will remain of poetry's originality. If so, many a brown nose and liar gets to have complete control. How we gonna ever write a verse to spit when killers still approach? I bore the burden of my words upon my back until I grieve what shall remain of poetry when it is finally relieved. The saddest thing in this world, my lady. Is knowing that we were meant to be from the very start, but that might never be. Yeah, so I think you know what he's saying by now. And I hope you remember what I'm about to ask you. Yo, if I ask you what's the mask, it's like, tell me that it's like a glimpse into the. Right, so if they ask you what's the mask, it's like, say it's a glimpse into the afterlife. That's what I tell them when they huh, ask me what's the mask, it's like, I tell them that it's like a glimpse into the afterlife. Afterlife. Heavenly hell, when relishing in poetic embellishments, memory fails. And that's life. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Amazing, incredible. Hey, it's funny, I feel like my neighbors are like, what's going on over there? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I had to do the the call and response. I unmuted no, no, myself for that. No, that's great. Um, which one was it that did it, though? Was it Sadia One or Sadia? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> it so, was the um. What what do we call this? The futuristic. The futuristic Sadia future. Right, not the MLK Memorial one. Okay. Um, yo, before I continue, does anybody have any questions about that piece or thoughts? feelings um it's not really a question but it's just a thought i think this is the first time i realized probably because the lyrics were up that you snuck a seinfeld re reference into this. <laughs> yes indeed oh, man. <laughs> Sly. Sly. man you know i get I, I performed this track for like 10 years now as you can see off the copyright date on it and it I, it tickles me to no end when i'm performing it to see somebody in the crowd there's always like one person that just like <laughs> Like, did you hear that? Did you? Did, am I crazy? <laughs> Festivus for the rest of us. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. So you know, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up, though. Like, I, it's, it's not all like super serious. You know what I'm saying? And it wouldn't be me if I didn't bring in a little bit of of my own sort of experience into it. Um, and yeah, you know, Jerry Seinfeld's mother was Syrian. A lot of people don't know that a Syrian Jew. That's right. Yeah. We they. Um, They've all but left Damascus, very sadly. The Jewish quarter is pretty much empty. There's like two people left, um, literally. 
but uh but they've coalesced in a neighborhood in brooklyn uh and they like they like run it like it's like that whole block is theirs and from what i'm told there was like an edict that was issued i think it was like 1913 or something where their head rabbi said if you marry outside of our syrian jewish community even if it's another jew uh, from a different community, you will be excommunicated. And I was like, that's the most serious shit I've ever heard. <laughs> um, anyway. I, uh, I have a question actually real quick. Yes. Um, so before, uh, like, before Islam spread really fast and really wide, um, was the indigenous language of the area in Syria, was it Arabic? Because I know like North Africa, they had Amazia. So Arabic wasn't the original language. So I wonder if in Syria, there was already that like poetry culture before Arabi and yeah. Arabic and like that poetry culture came. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely I'm sure there was like a strong poetic and musical uh, presence within the uh, Syriani and Arami sort of like uh, languages that existed there. So Aramaic and Syriac, you know, and uh, Arami is essentially the, it's like the mother tongue uh, of, of all Semitic languages in many ways, um, Northern Semitic languages, I should say. Uh, it's what Isa alayhi salam spoke, Jesus, you know, and there's two cities, uh, villages rather, in, in Syria, just north of Damascus, called uh, Saidnaya and Ma'lula, where people still speak Arami. And that's um, Muslim and Christian uh, uh, families still keep up the tradition of, of learning and, 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 and propagating the language. Uh, and it's really fascinating, you know, because when I hear it spoken, uh, so much of the way that we speak Arabic in Syria, it, it's influenced by that, that mother language that existed there prior. Uh, the difference between the Amazigh influence on North African Arabic and the, and the Syriani and Arami influence in Syria is that it was a Semitic language. So it's actually similar. It's just the way that we say things are a little different. Um, so... I remember being at my school and being told that like, you know, all, the way that Egyptians speak Arabic is like bastardized. The way that Syrians speak Arabic is bastardized. This is the real Arabic. And like, that's just BS, man. You know, like, it's just the echoes of these, these indigenous languages that were there before, you know, that have kind of like uh, influenced the way that we speak it now. And there's so much of that that exists in how we speak Arabic. Um, and you know, language is like really fluid. Like you don't draw hard lines when it comes to culture or language. And so uh, there's a really fascinating um, uh, linguist slash archeologist. I, I don't know how exactly he would describe himself. Uh, Ahmed Al-Jallad, he's on Twitter. And he's been unearthing and discovering uh, what he calls a Safaitic language, uh, which are, uh, which he's been able to put together and decipher. And they're inscriptions on these black, uh, um, volcanic rocks that are strewn throughout the Jordanian desert. And he's uh, basically, I can't sum up his like life's work because it's just a lot, but, um, but he's just showing how there was a bridge languages between, uh, you know, the Arabic that was spoken in the Hejaz and the way that Syrians spoke, there was this other language in between that, that creates that bridge in both time and, uh, and in, um, you know, linguistic study. So it's fascinating. Um, and, you know, a lot of Islam's sort of uh, kind of rejection of the past uh, and calling everything prior to that jahiliya ended up sort of erasing a lot of these traditions. Um, but they're so prevalent. And once you sort of unlock that and you start realizing, at least when I do as a Syrian person, um, what, like, for example, the, uh, the melodies and the intonations, the maqams that exist and the way that we, we, we sing them, whether it's the Quran or it's in a church or it's in a, a, a Jewish or Aramaic sort of tradition or Armenian even, like, they're all the same, you know? It's like the, the, the musicality is the same. So the, the spirit and the soul is the same. And the way that people there connected to God, to Allah, to whoever uh, was... Uh, you know, fed through this beautiful sort of like musical poetic thing that like tapped into their spirits and their souls and passed down through generations, even when the language evolved. Um, so anyway, I kind of went on a tangent there, but, but that's a great question. And thank you for, for bringing it up. In fact, my next uh, single, which I'll be releasing in the next two weeks, inshallah, uh, it's called Samra. Uh, and that just means uh, like brunette or brown skin girl. Um, I'd written it in honor of my mother and my wife and my daughter. Um, 
you know, of, you know, the, the beautiful samras around the world. Uh, but the hook uh, or one section of the song, I'm saying yamo, uh, yamo, yamo. And yamo is how we say, oh, mama, you know, uh, and that's actually the old Syriani Arami way to say it. Uh, it's not ya, ya ummi, it's yamo, you know, and we put an O at the end of a lot of things in Syria. Uh, and so it's just kind of like um, one example of that. And I grew up saying it and not really realizing that that's what that was. And there's so much of that in how we speak. Um, so it's, uh, it's cool. We'll look forward to the um, single being dropped. Um, so we'll make, we'll make sure to keep an eye out for that. But you are not going to believe how fast time flies. <laughs> yes. Man, okay. Um, so I don't know. Um, I know. I know the sun has just. I'll give you a little gift for being here with us. I want to show you the, the artwork to uh, to this next single. Okay. I wish you didn't do this, but I'm just so so stoked by it. It's uh, it's my beautiful mama right there and her. Wow. From back in the day. So, the album is called Lost in Translation, uh, and it's a full collaboration between me and a local uh, Syrian American producer um, by the name of Thanks Joey. Uh, and it's uh, it's real special, y'all. I hope you enjoy it. It's a lot of, well, translation, obviously, um, but uh, it features so many samples from this um, really iconic uh, Syrian comedian from Damascus. His name was Dureid Laham, uh, or Gawar Tosh. It was the character that he had created. Um, I don't know what I'd compare him to, like a Richard Pryor or something, maybe, I don't know, but he... Uh, he had a lot of music in his movies uh, and he did a lot of funny little like um, moments between characters because he spoke so many languages. Um, and so just my sort of experience growing up here as I described it earlier in, in the meeting, um, meeting, uh, Cypher uh, was, was sort of that, you know, finding myself through these two languages and these traditions and just like sort of finding my path in it. Uh, and it kind of like is all pre ever present on this album. So I'm really excited to be releasing it soon. And it's really upbeat and fun. And I hope folks on lockdown at home can just enjoy themselves and dance to it. Because this song, for example, Samra, I literally wrote while I was dancing with my baby girl in our living room. Um, so I hope folks can, uh, can find some comfort in it, inshallah. We look forward to it. Um, I, uh, I just... Uh, so I just want to say this. So I know we, we actually have more content. We wanted to go through everybody. And I'm really sad that we can't go through that second song. But um, the hope and the prayer is that we can continue these internet ciphers. So um, right now we're running them through like the end of April, right before the month of Ramadan begins, which is in like the last week of April. So look out for them. They're every Monday and Wednesday at 630 Central. And then Saturday is at 2 just a reminder that these ciphers are being held uh, specifically for people who are most vulnerable in this time or people who are in a older like age age range so people who are old, over the age of 60 so let you know your grandma your uncles whoever your neighbors know about these ciphers because um these are intentional to be held space you know holding space for them um and on that note, I think we'll, the sun has just set. I know several of us are, are partaking in like fasting today. I want to honor the sunset and the, and the um, sunset prayer. So I want to honor the time that, that we had allotted here. And I want to sincerely thank you, Omar. And uh, God willing, I pray that we can have you back again for a part two. Um, so continue, y'all. Please share about this. Please um, you know, share about this on your social media. Let folks know about um, Iman and the work that we're doing. We are trying to uh, respond to the moment with these kind of commissioned commissioned work with the artists. So um, we're doing that with the support of Chicago Beyond and several um, other foundations, but also um, the donations, we're getting ready to launch our, our Ramadan campaign, which is the, a really big and significant moment for Iman. So please y'all uh, uh, spread the word and just, you know, word of mouth, prayer, all that really truly matters. Y'all being here really truly matters. I look forward to seeing y'all on Wednesday. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to somebody to, to close us in prayer. So Omar, I'm going to turn it over to you. I just want to take a second to thank everyone as well, uh, from the bottom of my heart for being here. It's almost like having you with me. Uh, and I, uh, forgive me if anything was an error. Uh, and I pray that we can continue these internet ciphers in the future, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to close it out by saying in the name of the one, the creator and the sustainer of the earth, the moon, and the sun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
wa ta'ala. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to connect in this way. Uh, in this uh, trying time, we are reminded of the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, uh, and we are grateful forever. We will pass on the knowledge and the wisdom that we have gained to the younger generations and the older generations and everything in between uh, with every last breath. La ilaha illa ant. Thank you all so much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum.